good seed and the bad seed. This is Prophecy Pearls. Let's take our Bibles out and we're going to go over to, uh, let's go to Matthew 13, verse 18. We'll start at 18. Are you ready? Hear ye therefore. Well, let's pray real quick, okay? Lord, we surrender to you. We love you, praise you, honor you, and worship you because you are worthy. Almighty King, grant us wisdom and understanding into your word, we pray. And I surrender all unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mwah. Okay. Let's go starting at Matthew 13, 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Okay. I think I can put this. Let me bring this up. Oh, did I write on myself? Hold on. Leakage. Okay. Matthew 13, 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Now, do you know who these two are? When someone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it, and understands it not, if they don't understand it, the wicked one comes and catches it away, and they never give another thought to it again. He that receives the seed into the stony places, they hear the word and receive it with joy, but they have no root in themselves. Verse 21, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. They can hang in there for a little while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth, because of the word, by and by he is offended. He's standing for Jesus and somebody makes some kind of wisecrack at him that makes him feel humiliated and he gets offended and backs off from following Jesus. In verse 22, he also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, the care of this world, deceitfulness of riches, choke the word. They choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. So those who receive the seed among the thorns, they are. They love Jesus. They want to want to follow Jesus, but the cares of this world distract them. Their attitude is like, well, how can I follow Jesus when I have to make a living and take care of my family? You know, I have to care about the things of this world because I have to, I have to take care of my family. Well, you know what? Your job is one of two things, and that is entirely up to you. It is you working for some some person that you don't really have a lot of respect for, or maybe you do, but you think you're getting your paycheck from them for the efforts you put into it. Or you can view your job as your mission for the king. You going on your mission for the king every day, you just happen to go to that place to do it, and that you look to the king to pay you. And that's just the place you work for him. That is an attitude where you can walk according to the word. Rather than having the cares of this world uh, just drag you down. It's your, all in your perspective. Are, are you working for the king and going on your mission to work each day? Or are you a slave to your employer and you're working uh, as a slave and getting the penance that the uh, employer wants to give you? You're much better off working for the king. <laughs> that way he's in control of all of your promotions and your bonuses and your paycheck and, and your raises and all of that. Now, if you want to be worldly minded, then your employer is going to be in charge of all that. 
But if you're looking to God as your uh, sovereign and you're on your mission for him, then he's the one who you look to for your blessings. So don't make excuses about how you have to take care of your family. So you have to concern yourself about the cares of the world. You can serve God and make a living in the secular world. It's all in your perspective. Okay. And in who you are viewing as the authority. If you're viewing your employer as the authority, you feel like you're in slavery and bondage and you don't like it. But if you're going on your mission for the king to this same employer, then that's a whole different perspective. Takes the employer out of the equation, basically, and the Lord Jesus Christ is the one in control of your life and not some employer who you wish you didn't work for. Okay? If you, need, if you want another job, talk to the king about it. <laughs> He's the one... Put your life in his hands so he can control your circumstances. He's controlling them anyway, but he's going to drag you through the mud until you learn. As soon as you get a, a perspective of who's boss, he's the boss, okay? He's the big cheese. So as long as you're acknowledging that in your everyday life, you're going to be just fine. Now it says here, um... In verse 23, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. See, God has to give you understanding. Understanding is one of the seven spirits before the throne of God, and they are named in Isaiah 11 too. Um, he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it. He understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. So see, you can't understand it unless God gives you understanding and you can't bear the fruit of the Spirit unless Jesus in you is bearing those fruits in you because those are his fruits and not ours. And it says, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. Are you witnessing to the people in your sphere of influence? You need to be confessing Jesus and you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to act like some crazy person. You just believe Jesus because of the evidence, not because of what you heard somebody say. Pick up your Bible yourself. You will find that Jesus is real. He's more real than you and I. Now let's take a look at the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, 24. Okay. Now, in Matthew 13, 24, another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, not while God slept, while men slept, his enemy, this isn't an enemy of God, this is an enemy of man, came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. What I'm trying to point out to you with these, these two passages, and we're going to do another one as well, is that there is a good seed and there is a bad seed. And a good seed doesn't become a bad seed with a decision. A bad seed does not become a good seed with a decision. Okay? You're either a good seed or a bad seed because that's what you're created to be. Now, that's one of the reasons why the Lord says he separates the sheep and the goats. The wheat and the tares. Two different species. Now let's run over to Romans chapter 9. And let's talk about these two different seeds. Okay? Now, it says, 
Let's look at verse 7 of Romans chapter 9. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So just because you're a blood descendant of Abraham, that doesn't make you a part of Israel. Israel is the sheep. Okay? The wicked are the goats. In verse 8, that is, they which are not the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. See, they are a certain kind of seed. You're either born to be a good seed or born to be a bad seed. Okay? Now, let's, let's pull, come on down here. And I want to show you something. Now, look in, uh, well, let's just keep going here. In verse 9, For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Now, you might notice here on earth the way things are done, the firstborn inherits. But in God's promise line, it's been the secondborn or after that inherits. It wasn't Ishmael, the firstborn of Abraham, that inherited. It was Isaac, the child of the promise. Isaac's sons, Esau and Jacob, it wasn't, es God decided it was going to, that the elder would serve the younger. So even though Esau was the firstborn and the heir according to the world, Jacob was God's choice to be the heir. Now there's, there's a good seed and there's a bad seed. Let's keep going. Uh, in verse 13, is it as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated? Well, you think, well, why did he hate Esau? Well, he's going to tell you. He's made vessels that are fitted for destruction. That means they're created to be destroyed. Those are the bad seed, the seed of the enemy, the ones that are created to be destroyed. Then there are there is the seed of four prepared unto glory. Those are the children of God. Now let's keep going here. So he says in verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He chooses what we are created to be, whether bad seed or good seed. So then it is not of him that willeth. See, it's not, there's no free will option in here. It is not of him that willeth, <laughs> nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So he either chooses to create you as a bad seed or a good seed, and you have no control over that. Now remember, an obedient goat is not a sheep, and a disobedient sheep is not a goat. These are separating species, not good and bad. Now watch, look at 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, See, he's raising Pharaoh up for his own purposes, that I might show my power in thee. He's, he raised him up as a demonstration tool, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. So anybody who's got a hard heart against God, that's because God has hardened it, has hardened their hearts. He's the one, it says here, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? That's the question, isn't it? They're asking, If God made me this way, why is he going to punish me? <laughs> Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? He's saying, I can make... Any, I have the right to do whatever I choose with my own creations. Who can argue with that? If we create something, we feel like we have the right to do with it what we want, don't we? If we, if we create a paper plate, do we not create it to be used as a tool and then destroyed? It's no different for the seed of the enemy. God's not being mean or cruel. He's created them to be a paper cup <laughs> or a paper plate. 
to be used for a purpose and then discarded. And that's how you have to think about the seed of the enemy, the bad seed, the goats, the tares. Now he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? It's kind of like complaining and, and, and <coughs> uh, how are you going to feel if the paper plate complains that you're mean and hateful because you're using it and then discarding it? It's the same thing. So in verse 21, hath not the powder power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Fitted to destruction. That means they were purposely created to be destroyed like a paper cup, like a paper plate. Okay, they have a job to do and then they're, they are uh, destroyed. Okay, that doesn't make God mean because he makes a paper plate, uses it and chunks it. Okay, that's basically what he's doing. And look at verse 23, and that he might make known the vessels, I mean that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. So he's saying here that he creates some vessels to be fitted for destruction, destroyed, and others are afore prepared unto glory. So that afore, that means before they ever came here, they were born as children of God. They were born prepared unto glory. Okay? And the Lord's sacrifice applies to them who are born of God. But those who are fitted to destruction, they have no redemption plan because they have no human soul. Okay? They function. I, like, I kind of look at them as uh, computer-generated opponents. I don't, they, don't feel any, they don't feel love. Love to them is, not, is infatuation and desire and, and flesh things. But they know nothing of unconditional love, the kind of love that was shown to us by Jesus Christ on the cross. They know nothing of that. Now he says, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in OC, I will call them my people, which were not my people. That's the Gentiles that are born of God. Her, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said to them, Ye are not my people, Gentiles, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Those who are Jews who accept the Messiah and those who are Gentiles that receive the Messiah are going to both be evacuated when he comes for us at the sixth seal or just after the sixth seal. And we explained some of that yesterday. Now, does anybody have any questions in the chat room about these things? I want to be sure and um, answer any questions you may have. Okay. I think some people are having a hard time finding the live broadcast today. Rekich. Um if you're on Ustream, you need to switch over to Daily Motion. It's uh, Troy says that Ustream is having some problems today, but Daily Motion is doing just fine. And so, if you're on Daily Motion, just stay there. If you're on Ustream, you might. If you're having any issues, you might come over to Daily Motion. Now, d any questions? Now. What I am saying here, if you're asking yourself, what is she saying? I'm saying that a decision does not change your species, okay? If you love Jesus, it's because you were born to love Jesus. You were born of God. If you don't and you won't, well, I mean, we can't really make that distinction between anybody because we don't know if they're lost and a tear and a goat or if they are a future believer, 
if they're born of God and they just haven't received the message yet or been drawn yet by the king. John 6, says, no man can come unto me unless the father who sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. So you must be drawn to Jesus Christ by the father personally. Okay. You're never going to want to consider Jesus. You're never going to consider eternal things. You're going to just see all of the cross and all of these things about Jesus as just foolishness. If you are not born of God and those, if, if that is you and you feel inside, like you want to know God, then you are born of God. You just hadn't been drawn yet. Okay. He, he's faithful. He plants seeds and waters seeds of the truth in our lives. And at some point when we're ready, he will draw us. And if he draws you, you come. Okay. He's you. It's not like you have the power to resist his will. Remember what it says right here in Romans nine, uh, 19. Well, thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Nobody resists his will. Nobody does. That's that's how it is. Now, um, I love you guys. Is any is there any questions in the chat room? I think we've been having trouble with our chat room today. But we're gonna go to a break. We're gonna come back and we're gonna get into our Bible study in Revelation chapter two. Don't go away. 